It's not bragging if you can back it up, is the old saying. And for many years, Shawn Michaels would brashly let us all know just who WWE's unquestioned showstopper really was. Even if you, like Jim Cornette, detested Michaels with every fibre of your being, you had to come to the same conclusion as the most dedicated of HBK fans. The Heartbreak Kid truly was the greatest at what he did. No wrestler before or since has displayed his particular blend of technique, charisma, selling, timing, athleticism, and those rare intangibles. You don't know the name Mr. WrestleMania without excelling on the largest stage time and time again, and no wrestler would do so as consistently and with as much gusto as Shawn Michaels. Michael Sean Hickenbottom inverted his first and middle names to create his professional handle, while training at the steady hand of veteran grappler Jose Lothario. Michaels made his in-ring debut in October 1984, losing to Art Cruz in a textbook undercard bout for a Mid-South wrestling card. Reportedly, the performance of the 19-year-old Michaels impressed many of the veterans on hand, who were a little bit surprised to learn that it was only his first match. From there, Michaels would cross over into different territories, including World Class in Dallas, Central States in Kansas City, and closer to home in Texas All-Star Wrestling. At the age of 20, Michaels debuted for Vern Garnier's American Wrestling Association, joining up with Marty Jannetty, with whom he'd previously teamed in Central States, to form the Midnight Rockers. It was there that the two boyish, fun-loving high flyers would engage in an exciting, sometimes bloody feud with the duo of Buddy Rose and Doug Summers, which would eventually involve the AWA World Tag Team belts. The teams feuded throughout 1986, the chase culminating with the Midnight Rockers winning the titles in January 87. Sadly, they would have to drop the gold that May to Boris Zhukov and Soldat Ustinov, but it was because bigger things were on the horizon. One week after dropping the belts, the Midnight Rockers followed in the footsteps of many AWA stars before them, brother, and turned up in WWE. They only lasted a couple of days with the promotion before being fired, the result of an apparent altercation at a bar after one TV taping. What a pair of naughty boys. Michaels and Jannetty felt that they had blown the chance of a lifetime and were stuck traveling through territories like Continental Wrestling and Memphis before turning back up in AWA. There, they regained the tag team belts once more, defeating the Dennis Condry and Randy Rose version of the Midnight Express before dropping the gold to Pat Tanaka and Paul Diamond, aka Bard Company. But it wasn't all over. One year after watching the WWE dream go up in smoke, Michaels and Jannetty were called back to the company by Vince McMahon, who was willing to give them another chance. Trying harder to be a little bit more professional, the pair wrestled under the shortened name of The Rockers and excited crowds with their elaborate double teams and endless energy. Sometimes nicknamed the Masters of Motion, The Rockers dazzled audiences in bouts with the Brain Busters and the Fabulous Rougeos, and even face versus face epics with the Heart Foundation. Of course, Brett and Sean would go on to have many more battles, but that's quite a different story. We'll get to that later. In the heavyweight-dominated WWE landscape of the late 80s and early 90s, the Rockers were a true revelation. It was against the hearts in the fall of 1990 that the Rockers would be the subject of one of wrestling's most delectable what-if mysteries throughout history. At a Saturday night's main event taping, Michaels and Jannetty won the World Tag Team titles from the Heart Foundation in a two out of three falls match, marking the first title that either rocker would hold in WWE. However, one of the ropes legitimately broke during the match, causing it to degenerate into a sort of meandering cluster flip. Not wanting to air the match in that condition and changing his mind about phasing Jim Neidhart out as a wrestler, Vince McMahon chose to throw it out and keep the belts with the hearts, so the match officially never really took place. Sorry, Sean. Over the next year, the Rockers would continue on as a mid-card tandem, facing the likes of the Orient Express and Haku and the Barbarian in some really underappreciated appreciated pay-per-view matches. But the Rockers felt like they were stuck in neutral for the most part, and in fact the end would soon be near. After some miscommunications and general dissension late in 91, Michaels began displaying more arrogant tendencies, really annoying his longtime partner. Then came the summit on Brutus Beefcake's barbershop, where Michaels feigned a truce with Jannetty before super kicking him and then infamously launching him through the barbershop's glass window, drawing rare blood for WWE TV of the day. Michaels had gone bad, but he hadn't gone solo. Now presented as a preening, narcissistic chauvinist, Michaels was paired with sensational Sherry, who added overtly carnal nuance to Michaels' newfound bite. Michaels would flesh out his conceited quirks, mixing the wild bum-taking of somebody like Mr. Perfect with the cunning ring generalship of someone like Ric Flair. And his improvements were really demonstrated in matches with the likes of Randy Savage and Bret Hart. In the fall of 92, Michaels would be astonished by the return of a vengeful Jannetty and, like a coward, sacrificed Sherry in the midst of Jannetty's attack in order to save himself. Michaels may have lost the go, 
girl, better her than him, I suppose he thought, but he would gain gold shortly afterwards. Not long after truly going solo, Michaels outlasted Intercontinental Champion Davey Boy Smith on Saturday night's main event, capturing his first official championship in WWE. Yeah, that tag team title one just didn't, just didn't ever happen. If you were there in the venue at the time, just try to ignore it. He would lose to WWF Champion Bret Hart in the main event of that year's Survivor Series, but continued his upward rise, holding court with the workhorse belt. Michaels survived in matches against Jannetty, Tatanka, and Mr. Perfect throughout 93, save for a three-week stretch in which his ex-rocker's partner carried the gold. He won it back, but Michaels' time as champion came to an abrupt end in September, when he was suspended for flunking a test for steroids, a charge, by the way, that he still adamantly denies. In fact, Michaels briefly quit WWE out of protest, during which time Razor Ramon won the vacant title. When Michaels was coaxed back into the company that November, because they knew just how good he was, he carried around a duplicate IC belt, claiming to still be the rightful champion, and disputing Razor's reign. This led to one of WWE's most famous matches of the time at WrestleMania 10 inside Madison Square Garden, a ladder match with both belts hanging over the ring to settle the dispute. Michaels and Razor warred for 19 excellent minutes, executing stunts never before seen in WWE before Ramon narrowly pulled down both straps for the victory. The match is revered as an all-time classic, especially because it took place at WrestleMania, and it really established Michaels' reputation for stealing the show on the grandest stage of them all. Many more further examples would follow. Sean firmly established himself as a one-of-a-kind performer in that ladder match, and a year later would actually be in the World Championship match at WrestleMania 11 against a man that had been his ally from June 93 till Survivor Series 94, Diesel. The pair broke up following a handful of miscues and when Diesel won the top prize shortly afterwards, Michaels earned the right to chase him via winning the 95 Royal Rumble match from the number one position, the first man ever to go coast to coast. Michaels even replaced Diesel with a new bodyguard in the form of Sid, but ultimately would fall short at WrestleMania, both in the ring in terms of losing the match and outside of the ring because he wasn't in the main event. That of course would go to Bam Bam Bigelow and wrestling legend Lawrence Taylor. The following night on Raw, Sean blamed Sid for the loss and was subsequently destroyed by the Psycho One then and there to the tune of three crunching powerbombs. Diesel then ran in to save his former friend and in that moment it actually signaled Michaels' return to the babyface side of the fence. Yes, he maintained his outward self-confidence, only now he clowned WWE's villains instead of taunting the heroes. He would win his third IC title in July 95 from Jeff Jarrett before vacating it after an infamous incident outside of a Syracuse nightclub involving, well, depending on who you listen to, one or several Marines. He would then set his sights once more on WWE's richest prize. Michaels won his second consecutive Royal Rumble in 96, earning a shot once more at the WWF Championship, held by fellow babyface Bret the Hitman Hart. Their WrestleMania 12 main event clash would be a 60-minute Iron Man match, the ultimate test of endurance for two of the generation's most gifted stars. After an epic length battle, Michaels realized his often referenced boyhood dream when he pinned Bret with two super kicks in the overtime period, capturing the WWF Championship championship that he'd worked his whole life for. But while Michaels' in-ring performances remained the stuff of legend, his company fell behind a surging WCW, thanks, ironically, to Michaels' former clickmates, who were turning heads alongside Hulk Hogan with the emergence of the New World Order. Michaels, by his own admission, handled the pressures of being a champion pretty poorly. Despite troubles outside of the ring, however, his title reign would be filled with acclaimed performances against the likes of Diesel, Davey Boy Smith, Vader, and Mankind, while also fraught with real-life controversies such as the curtain call and the mid-match shoot on Vader where he screamed in the giant's face. His reign was also plagued by insecurity, perhaps caused by the loss of his good friends to WCW. And when Michaels finally dropped the belt to Sid at the 96 Survivor Series in New York, he would be booed in a fashion not dissimilar to the likes of John Cena and Roman Reigns after him. He regained the belt at the Royal Rumble in his native San Antonio, but dropped it shortly afterwards via the infamous Lost Smile speech, claiming a career-threatening knee injury. Again, depending on who you ask, this may have had something to do with the fact that Michaels was rumoured to be dropping the belt to Bret Hart at WrestleMania, repaying the favour from one year prior. Controversies continue to follow Michaels, particularly in the form of real-life animosity with Hart that turned ugly, as the two infamously fought backstage for real the night after the 97 King of the Ring. Michaels temporarily walked out of the company, returning to initiate a heel turn and then feud with The Undertaker. It was in that feud that three very important things came to pass. The birth of D-Generation X, the first ever Hell in a Cell match, and the debut of Kane. That cell match with The Undertaker was a genuine masterpiece of mayhem and carnage, once again affirming Michaels' in-ring brilliance. But brilliance would precede betrayal, as five weeks later, one of the most infamous moments in WWE history played out at the 97 Survivor Series in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. With Vince McMahon overseeing the operation, Michaels helped carry out a conspiracy against main event opponent and WWF champion Bret Hart. 
This would see the WCW-bound title holder defeated through a premature and false submission stoppage. Michaels had little love lost for Bret Hart at the time, but did admit that his participation in the Montreal Screwjob gnawed at him, as he knew he was already an unpopular figure in the locker room. Bret was finished as a WWE wrestler, and very soon Michaels would be as well. It was in his third championship reign that Michaels sustained a back injury at the 1998 Royal Rumble, whilst wrestling in a casket match with The Undertaker. Weeks later at home, Michaels was said to be unable to even stand up and had to be taken to the hospital where severe damage to his discs was revealed. The champ stayed out of the ring until WrestleMania 14, where he put over Stone Cold Steve Austin while in obvious pain during the latter portions of the match. At the age of 32, and having passed the torch to the next big thing in wrestling, his future in the business was suddenly very much in question. And when the dust settled after WrestleMania, HBK was nowhere to be seen. He would return to the company in various non-wrestling roles such as commissioner, special guest referee, guest commentator, and that sort of thing. Out of the ring, Michaels busied himself training wrestlers down in Texas, including the likes of Brian Kendrick, Lance Cade, and Daniel Bryan. He even worked a match in the year 2000 for his Academy's tie-in promotion, defeating former partner and rival Paul Diamond in a street fight. However, during this period, Michaels struggled with painkillers to the point where he passed out backstage at the Go Home Raw before WrestleMania 17 in 2001, and was summarily sent home. During the one-year stretch that followed, Michaels became a born-again Christian and also managed to kick his addiction, motivated by wanting to be a good example for his young son. After putting his bad habits behind him, Michaels returned to WWE in what many assumed would be a non-wrestling role in 2002, as the man mouthpiece for the floundering New World Order, or New New World Order because, you know, it wasn't the 90s anymore and they were trying it again. When that fell by the wayside, Michaels ended into a rivalry with real life best best friend ever ever, Triple H. One that would see Michaels wrestle his first WWE match in over four years. With no signs of ring rust evident whatsoever, Michaels carried his half of an absolute thriller at SummerSlam 2002, a dramatic and uplifting brawl for the ages. Cashing in on his unexpected comeback, Michaels captured the final world title of his career, the New World Heavyweight Championship belt from Triple H in the first ever Elimination Chamber match at Survivor Series 2002. What a huge moment. For the time being, Michaels was keeping his performances few and far between, not wanting to take too many chances with his health. He was, however, coaxed into a feud with Chris Jericho that led to WrestleMania 19, with Michaels edging out his younger rival. With that performance, he reclaimed his Mr. WrestleMania mantle that had pretty much gone nameless to this point, once again stealing the show on wrestling's biggest stage. For the remainder of 2003, Michaels worked as a regular on the Raw brand and closed out that calendar year with an instant classic against Helmsley again that ended in a double pinfall. The epic performances did not end there, even as Michaels' 40th birthday came into view. For a man who spent four years on the shelf to deal with back injuries and personal issues, to watch him go in the ring, you'd honestly never have known it. The triple threat against Triple H and Chris Benoit at WrestleMania 20, and the WrestleMania 21 battle and eventual rematch with Kurt Angle kept Sean in the same tier of workmanship that he had existed in a decade earlier, when many of his locker room peers were still in school. And as a little bit of a throwback to his more controversial days in the 90s, HBK could also steal the show with one ton of reverence and mischievousness, as seen in the iconic clash with Hulk Hogan at SummerSlam 2005. Just look at some of those bumps. As the calendar flipped to 2006, Michaels began doling out crotch chops once more, well, making the gesture towards his belly button since he'd changed his weight. The first nod to his DX past came against Vince McMahon in an overachieving bloodbath at WrestleMania 22. Honestly, that match was so much better than it had any right to be. The DX reunion was made official late that spring when Triple H turned babyface in order to create hijinks with his old friend once more. The two terrorized the McMahons with gags that were more Warner Brothers inspired than truly edgy, but whatever, they sold a ton of glow sticks nonetheless. But Michael still had business to attend to as an in-ring deity, and continued to churn out the classics. A WrestleMania 23 loss to WWE Champion John Cena could have been 2007's match of the year had the two not then topped themselves in a thrilling hour-long marathon in London the following month. The next WrestleMania would prove bittersweet for Sean, as he would be the one to retire Ric Flair, defeating his wrestling idol in heart-wrenching fashion. In the summer of 2008, things got personal between Michaels and a suddenly very serious Chris Jericho, who was intent on causing Michaels as ruin. One match at the Great American Bash then led into Jericho accidentally striking Michaels' wife Rebecca at SummerSlam. That was followed by an intense unsanctioned match at Unforgiven before the sworn enemies fought tooth and nail in a hate-filled ladder match four weeks later at No Mercy, ending perhaps the most personal feud of either man's career. Then came the two-part piece de resistance of Michaels' brilliant career. Two matches with The Undertaker at consecutive WrestleManias. I'm gonna guess that you've probably heard of these ones. The first match was solely waged 
injured on Pride and is cited as one of WWE's all-time greatest bouts. One year later, Michaels then wagered his career against Undertaker's streak and again came up short. At age 44, Michaels ended his in-ring career, let's just ignore Crown Jewel, the only appropriate way, with a show stealer. Michaels still pops up occasionally as a distinguished guest and keeps busy in NXT as both a creative mind and as the highest level of trainer, polishing the top athletes in Orlando's performance center. It's perhaps fair to say that Sean's career in wrestling has truly run the gamut of emotions, exhibiting as much genius as he has been the cause of numerous headaches. But today, the general consensus seems to be that the good has far outweighed the bad, and that his contributions to the business are more than enough to keep him in pro wrestling's pantheon for eternity. Shawn Michaels always strived to be the best, and inside that wrestling ring, he was always able to continuously prove that he was. So that was the captivating career of Shawn Michaels. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to at Jack the Jobber. You can follow all of us over at Cultaholic. And check out our Patreon as well if you want to. Patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And of course, never forget, if you haven't done so already, to hit subscribe and to join us.